host, the nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockheim. This is Neil Rockheim, and welcome to another edition of Killer Cross-Examination, the podcast where we talk about all issues of examination, where we talk about cross-examination in the courtroom, and we even give you ways to apply some of these concepts, concepts of truth-telling and of getting to the truth in your own personal lives. And from time to time, we venture into legal issues. We talk about current events, current topics, current issues. We share war stories. And that's what this is really all about, is bringing my experiences in the courtroom and the things that I've learned and tried to, uh, to teach other lawyers uh, and bring them to you and try to do it in an interesting way so that not only are you entertained, but Uh, Every episode, every week, you leave with some useful information, some useful tools, some things that you can utilize as a lawyer or in your own lives. But today I want to talk about something, a cross-examination I just recently did in an issue that seems to keep coming up time and time and time again, and I'm sick and tired of this issue. I'm sick and tired of the ability of the or the practice of certain police officers or certain police departments uh, and, and their their gathering of evidence and how they do it in a way that only confirms or supports the allegations against a particular person rather than going out and seeking all of the evidence including evidence that could literally prove that a, a person is being wrongly accused or that a person acted in self-defense now there's a particular term in the law called exculpatory evidence. And it's a term that, that as a lawyer you learn in your, as a law student, excuse me, you learn in your very first semester as a lawyer. And as a police officer a, a, at the academy, they teach you about gathering evidence and, and obtaining evidence, and they teach you about certain constitutional obligations, certain constitutional rights, certain things that the Supreme Court has said that police and prosecutors must do. And one of the things that police and prosecutors must do, and one of the things that we as law students learn in the very first semester in law school, is this concept of exculpatory evidence. It's not that difficult. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's simple. Exculpatory evidence is evidence that may tend to prove that the person accused didn't commit the crime. Simple. The legal system is premised on, and should be premised on, the idea that people are presumed innocent. Not that we gather evidence to find uh, evidence of guilt or to find evidence to support the allegations brought by a complainant or a complaining witness or an alleged victim, but the opposite, that we hear an allegation, we hear what's accused, and then what we do is we attempt to, we of course look for evidence and we gather evidence that, uh, uh, that maybe the allegation is true, but at the same time we should always be looking for and always be gathering and maybe even more paramount is attempting to gather and secure evidence that the person who's accused is innocent. And what is happening time and time and time again is that that portion, that part of the obligation, that critical cornerstone of the the legal criminal justice process is being overlooked. There's a case that came down years ago that was handed down by the, the U.S. Supreme Court called Brady versus Maryland. It's an easy case to look up and I hate to talk about case law because it's boring. But this case is really important. It's one of the most important cases that um, has uh, come out uh, and it's uh, handed down by the Supreme Court. And what it says is that prosecutors have an obligation to They have an affirmative duty to disclose exculpatory evidence to the accused. What does that mean? It means that they can't just sit there and and play, you know, like the, I didn't see it or I'm not aware of it or I didn't hear about it. That if exculpatory evidence, if they're aware of it, or more importantly, if the police department or those acting within the sphere of influence of the police department is aware of it, that they have an obligation to gather it and to turn it over. A prosecutor can't just sit there and say, oh, I didn't know about it, or my officers did, but they didn't tell me. 
But that's so obvious. It's so, it's so obvious that it shouldn't even have to have been said by the Supreme Court, but it was. And what we should be doing is advising and instructing police officers that it's their obligation to go out and not just gather evidence to prove that a crime may have been committed, but they should be going out and securing evidence that maybe the person who's accused didn't commit the crime. And that's not happening. I just finished a cross-examination in a case in which a client of mine, a client of ours, is accused of, of a crime. And from the very moment that our client was arrested, we were advising, we were communicating with the police department. Within moments of the, within moments, days of the incident, we were advising the police department, we were advising the authorities that there was other evidence, that there was evidence of innocence, that our client was acting in self-defense, and the evidence was out there. We did it by way of, we got an order from a court to preserve videos from all these neighboring businesses. We got order, an order from the court to preserve videos from a project in which the police department and local businesses have, this, um, have a, an agreement, this part of this project, this program, where the businesses will have uh, video evidence that will be automatically downloaded or shared with the police department. We did it in the way that we actually went out to the scene and we secured evidence and took photographs and secured physical evidence. We did it by sending a copy of the order before the prosecutor would even got the file. We sent a copy of the order demanding that these items, these videos be preserved. We actually sent the locations and the addresses in the order along to the police department. We followed up three days later and said, don't forget about these videos. We even pointed out that it was paramount that the police were in the best position to get the video evidence that would exonerate our client. During, we even sent out, subsequently, we, we did our best to secure it, but we told the police in a letter that you guys, given the current conditions, given the issues of the pandemic, given the, the ability of the police to gather, to find witnesses, to locate phone numbers, that they were in the best position to gather this evidence and it shouldn't be overlooked. We said that because, look, you and I both know that if I wanted a witness to assist in the defense of my client, that witness was on a cruise, I would have an almost impossible time getting that witness to court, if, no matter when it was. If the, if the government or the, the state needs a witness and that witness is on a cruise or overseas, you darn well know that they have the resources to get that person to court. They have the power, we don't. That's why the system requires that the state prove the case, that a person is presumed innocent, and the state has the burden of proof because they have the ability to gather the evidence, not us. But we actually tried, but we sent the police letters saying, get this stuff, it's important, it's important. Our client's innocent. This stuff is going to prove he's innocent. Get it, get it, get it, get it. We even listed the locations. And... The police response, crickets, crickets. The sound of silence that you just heard was the reaction that we got from the police department initially. So we raised the issue with the prosecutors and advised the prosecutors that we need this stuff to be gathered. And the prosecutors send out emails and may communicate and have phone calls with the detective. We hear nothing. We raise the issue again in court. We, we hear little. We hear, well, we're trying. We can, we're, we're reaching out to the officer. He's, do, he's, he's attempting to gather it. We, we get all of, the, we get all of the, the sound bites, all of the, the talking points that we're trying. Well, then I insist on a hearing after I get some communication that, the, uh, that, that there are no videotapes, that they don't exist, that there's no video surveillance. And I insist on a hearing, and I ask the court to set an expedited hearing, and I'm even willing under this one circumstance to do this hearing via uh, telephone, teleconference technology, because I figure I need to get this on the record quickly. 
And believe it or not, killer cross-examination and the techniques that I teach people to utilize in court works even on video conferencing. It's not the same as live cross-examination. Nothing will replace a live hearing. But in this limited context, the ability to actually conduct this hearing over uh, teleconferencing for this little brief issue worked. And the testimony that we got from the detective is eye-opening and scary. The detective actually, this was, a, this was a near verbatim exchange between he and I. And I asked him, so it's your obligation to go out and secure evidence, right? He says, yes. And it's your obligation, as part of that obligation to go out and secure evidence, you look for evidence that may support that a crime occurred, right? Yes. And also part of your obligation to secure evidence is to secure evidence that may prove that a crime didn't occur, right? Yes. Or that a person was wrongly accused, right? Yes. Or that a person is innocent, correct? Yes. And it's your obligation to secure all of that evidence, regardless of which way it tends to to lead or point, right? Yes. I said, and are you satisfied that you fulfilled that obligation or those obligations in this case? Yes. I said, what is exculpatory evidence? And the detective responded to me that he didn't know what the term meant. He didn't know what the term meant. This is the second time in the last month that police officers that I have cross-examined once in person, once during this limited teleconference hearing about this specific issue, admitted that they didn't know what the term exculpatory evidence is. If it's their obligation to secure it, and it's their duty to ensure that the evidence that they seek and that they attempt to gather may protect a person from being wrongly accused, in other words, exculpatory evidence, how can they look for it? How can they claim to fulfill that duty? if they don't even know what the term means. That is frightening. Be like asking somebody, did you look for my keys? Yes. Did you look everywhere you could? Yes. And then saying, do you know what a key is? And the person says, I don't even know what a key is. I'm sorry. Could you tell me what it is? How could you have looked for it? How could you say that you looked for it? How could you say that you fulfilled your duty to look for it and to seek it and to gather it and secure it if you don't know what it means, if you don't know what you're looking for? And because I was afraid that the detectives in this case would actually say that, we spelled it out in a letter in an order, in an email, that we even spelled out the reasons, and that is that they're in a better position to secure it. And what did this detective do? Nothing. Now, a lot of times, believe it or not, video evidence is written over, which means that it's saved on a drive or it's saved on a server somewhere as part of a computer program, and that when the computer program keeps creating more videos and more data, it will write over. Eventually, it fills up. The server fills up. And then what happens is it goes back and it writes over with new material some of the older stuff that's saved. So if, it was, if, if they have an overwrite program and, and it overwrites in 7 days or 14 days or 21 days or 30 days, that means that if that evidence isn't preserved within 7, 14, 21, or 30 days that it gets written over. It's not preserved. It's destroyed. It's gone. Now you understand the urgency with which we acted when we were sending letters to the police department, demanding that this evidence be secured, that they do their job to not just attempt to prove that a crime was committed, but to attempt to protect a person who was wrongly accused who's claiming he acted in self-defense. That this detective, he knew that stuff got overwritten. He knew that video, he admitted on cross-examination, my cross-examination, he understood that video evidence got overwritten and wasn't saved in perpetuity and forever. 
He knew the emails. He had them in front of him when he was testifying. He knew the dates he got the emails. He knew what was on the order. He knew the addresses of the location. And he at one point said, well, the, when I went out there, the businesses were closed because of the pandemic. And what about phone numbers? You have access to phone numbers. And if you needed to get a hold of a manager of a business, or you need to get a hold of an employee of a business, you would have done it. If it helped prove the case, you would have done it. Instead, what they did was they went out. He couldn't even say he went out within 30 days. In fact, he admitted that he didn't go out within 30 days of receiving the the order of discovery and receiving my emails. And then when I said between 30 and 60, he goes, I don't know. Closer to 60, I'm not sure. Did you contact any of the owners? You know, these businesses have registered agents, right? Right. They could. And they have managers, right? Yes. And they have phone numbers, right? Yes. And you have databases and the ability to access these things, don't you? Yes. How many phone calls did you make to people that worked at these businesses? None. How many phone calls did you make to managers? None. How many phone calls did you make to resident agents? No. Do you have any log that shows the your efforts at attempting to contact any of the people involved? No. So other than between 30 and probably closer to 60 days, having gone out and and sought or or knocked down some doors and discovering that these businesses were closed, what other efforts did you make? And I gave him the floor. None. Oh, he sent an email to the the technology department in, in the, with the city seeking video from the project where these businesses have a sharing arrangement, like I said, where video evidence gets sent to a server and can be saved or stored by the city for the solving of crimes. But the email I got back was that his request was too late. It was timed out. Look, this is is part of the problem, folks. I can cross-examine witnesses all day long, and I can, I can break witnesses all day long, and so can other good lawyers attempting to address issues like this and reveal that the police didn't do enough and that the police didn't go far enough and that we laid a trail for the police to actually literally like a breadcrumb trail to follow all the way through to get all of the evidence, not just the evidence that, that helps solve the crime or confirms what the the alleged victim or the complaining witness says, but evidence that proves that the complaining witness or may tend to prove that the witness is not being truthful or that the allegations are untrue or that someone acted in self-defense or that they got the wrong guy. But if they don't actually do it, if they just pay lip service to, well, yeah, of course we go out and look for that stuff, but they really don't, then the system falls on itself becomes a house of cards. Brady versus Maryland, the case that says that the police and prosecutors have an obligation to disclose exculpatory evidence, becomes meaningless if they don't actually look for it and gather it. And it's inexcusable. And I'm sick and tired of it. There is no excuse for me to have examined two witnesses from two different departments in two different counties within one month and had both of those witnesses, both experienced officers, look me in the eye and under oath and say, I don't know what the term exculpatory evidence means. We ought to start there. The number one responsibility of those that are investigating and prosecuting cases ought to be to ensure That evidence of innocence, evidence of justification like self-defense is preserved and secured. And we ought to stop putting people on trial and charging them with crimes and putting them on trial and making them actually stand before the court or the bar and where the police and the prosecutors haven't done that most important cornerstone. They haven't done that one thing. And too often courts will say, well, 
you know, we'll tell the jury that the police could have done more. Well, we'll you, Mr. Rockhine, you can argue that to the jury. But in some cases, people are still being convicted. Nobody should be put on trial. No one should be forced to stand trial in a case. No one should be accused in a case where the police and the prosecutors haven't fulfilled that minimal obligation. And I don't think that we should have to just take their word for it. I don't think it should just come down to a, a judge looking at a prosecutor and saying, well, the prosecutor knows what exculpatory evidence is, and I'm sure he or she has fulfilled their duty. Haven't you, Mr. Prosecutor? It's not the way it's supposed to work. We should be protecting people. And the way to protect them is to ensure that officers know what exculpatory evidence is, that officers go out and secure it and gather it, that officers gather all of the evidence, whether it tends to prove the allegation or disprove it, whether it tends to prove that the victim is being truthful or whether it tends to prove that the victim is being untruthful. And if they can't fulfill that minimal obligation, then no one should stand trial for that charge. This is Neil Rockhine, and thank you for tuning in to another edition of Killer Cross-Examination. Killer, 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 killer cross-examination. A podcast by your host, the nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockhine.